Without further ado, let me introduce you to Tracy, uh, who is an entrepreneur and software engineer known for her work advocating for diversity and inclusion in tech. She is currently the founder and CEO of Block Party, which builds tools for online safety and anti-harassment. She is also a co-founder of Project Include, a nonprofit working to create a tech ecosystem where everyone has a fair chance to succeed. And in 2013, which is how in fact I first came across Tracy, her Medium article, Where Are the Numbers, helped jumpstart the practice of tech companies disclosing their diversity data. Tracy was an early engineer at Pinterest, Quora, and the US Digital Service. So, first of all, Tracy, as I said, um, you know, I first came across you in this blog post that you wrote um, about the lack of data when it came to diversity in tech. And I'm just really interested to know what exactly it was that prompted you to write that blog post. There were a few things um, swirling around in my head uh, at the time that I wrote that blog post. One was um, as an engineer at a number of these different tech companies, it was very obvious to me that there was a diversity problem just looking around. I could see that there were not very many women or minorities. Um, but at the same time, despite tech's fixation on data and being data driven everything, there was no data on this problem. And it felt like um, the industry was actually trying to obfuscate the problem by not having data because then you can kind of say, well, maybe it looks bad, but it's a local, it's, it's a localized issue and like other teams are better or maybe it's not actually that bad across the industry. Um, and it was actually at an event uh, where Cheryl Sandberg was speaking. Um, she said something to the effect of the numbers of women in tech are dropping precipitously. Um, the question just popped into my head of what numbers is she talking about? Like, does she have data that nobody else has? Um, and so having been thinking about this problem as somebody who's very much affected by the lack of diversity, um, and then also like from the mindset of an engineer where I've been kind of like browbeaten into having to A-B test everything, measure the metrics on everything, it just felt so hypocritical that we weren't doing something about it. Um, I didn't actually expect anybody to release any data in response. Uh, so it was a very pleasant surprise that there was a bit of a small snowball effect and companies started releasing the data. And I guess in doing so, acknowledging that there was a bit of a problem, although unfortunately we don't seem to have made very much progress since then. But at least we know that it's bad. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that sort of answers um, kind of my, my next que question, which was gonna be about the reaction. So obviously some people did react by releasing the data. I'm assuming not everyone released the data. And, and I guess I'm also interested in knowing what was the reaction sort of, um, uh, emotionally isn't quite the right word, but as we both know, when you make a public feminist comment online, uh, people don't always react in a wholly positive way to that. So I was just wondering, you know, did you experience much backlash for writing that blog post? In the beginning, the feedback was all very positive. Um, I think it started getting traction, this idea of like uh, compiling data and publishing it. It started getting traction amongst startups where it was easy for individuals to just look around the room, look around their teams and collect the data. Mm -hmm. um, so on that front, it was very positive in that like there's all these folks who wanted to do something helpful but had never known what they could do to be helpful and this is one very easy task they could do which is like go look around their rooms and submit some data into like a shared repository to start creating these standards um it was maybe like six months later when google became the first big company to release their data and then they set in motion the trend of like all the other big companies following uh, what I heard through the grapevine, I've not been able to validate this, is internally at Google and the HR side, they had seen my blog post and it went up the ranks in terms of like the debate of whether or not they should release their data. Um, mm. It seemed to make sense um, if they actually cared about solving this problem and eventually got all the way up to the top and it was approved. Um, and that helped to set off the chain reaction, I think, of the other companies following. It was a risky move for Google to do. I think it was risky for all the companies prior as well, but Google was such a big one um, because prior to the industry data being out there, nobody actually knew if they were above or below average. And so it was unclear if you release the data, if you, you would be viewed as doing well or doing poorly. 
um, and if that might hurt hiring efforts in the future or just general reception. Um, so I mean, it was really great to see the big companies like Google and Facebook and Apple, and like, like everybody started releasing their data. It felt really powerful. Um, mm. So all of that, it, it felt really good. Um, it was kind of a delayed reaction thing though. I mean, it happened over many, many months. Um, the How long more was negative- it between you Sorry to interrupt, I want to hear that too, but how long between your blog posts being published and Google releasing its data, how, how long was there? I published my post in October of 2013. I think Google released their report something like May of 2014. So right, a little so bit over pretty, half a year. It was like pretty, pretty soon, rapid but for like a yeah. big company. Yeah, That's yeah. fantastic. Uh, and that must yeah, have so felt that incredible. Was great. No, it was, it was, yeah, it was amazing. I was like, wow, like a big company is doing this thing that I put in a blog post. I didn't expect anybody to really read. I was just kind of mouthing off after feeling frustrated at a conference. (laughs) Uh, So that was, that was great. Um, In terms of like negative reactions, I think it's been for the, uh, it's over the long haul of increased visibility, more and more folks will show up out of the woodwork on Twitter or like to post comments on my blog, whatever. Um, And it's not so targeted in response to the specific thing I did, but just people who are reacting to a woman who has opinions or has slightly progressive views. So um, I have noticed an increase just across the board and all the surface area of my online and social media activity of the negative comments and um, sexism and other sorts of offensive comments. Um, but it's not usually so specific as to like this particular blog post I wrote, mm-hmm. this particular movement. Um, it's, I think, just more in response to the visibility and the general themes of what I talk about and what I represent. Mm. Um, just sticking with the data um, and the employment stats just for, for a moment, because obviously we are going to go on to talk about anti your anti-harassment work um but one of the things that I found so bizarre when I was researching invisible women and writing about um these tech companies which are as you said so data driven and you found it so bizarre that there wasn't this 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 data on uh, diversity when everything else is so data driven and I'm just wondering what where you think the reluctance comes from in these incredibly data-driven companies to listen to the data on diversity. So obviously there's been some improvement from what you're saying that they are now publishing a certain amount of that data, but they're not seemingly listening to the research on how to improve those diversity statistics. Yeah. I think a lot of this gets at how uncomfortable the changes will have to be and how deep rooted the changes have to be. Um, When we think about solving diversity issues or lack of diversity issues, it gets at the structures of power and privilege and how decisions are made and how how investment money is decided and all these things that are really fundamental to how everything operates. it's not so easy to make these changes as maybe some things in engineering are. So I think for tech companies that are very used to optimizing their products, it can feel a lot more tractable to say, oh, we're gonna build this other feature or based on this A-B test, we're just gonna like make this change in our product. Like it's kind of a known thing what they need to do in terms of building out something in technology versus the very human problems. Like how do we fix bias or how do we how do we fix bias in the system how do we address bias in individuals that then like compounds in the system um i think fundamentally the the diversity issues reflect just like the very difficult problems in society and so Mm. even though there is data there it's not sufficient to motivate people to to solve things like um you know, giving up the seeding power when they have it and they want to believe that they deserve to be in these positions of success because they worked hard and other people just don't work hard. And so like, that's why, that's why things are the way they are. Um, I think the data now helps 
some folks are maybe more on the margin to see the issues and want to change. Um, but I think the inertia of the status quo is always going to be pretty big and mm. difficult to, to change. And do you think the lack of diversity in tech has an impact on what tech companies are creating and what they're producing? Oh, completely, completely. Because technology is created by people and we make the decisions on what we're going to build, how we're going to build it. And like every single small decision throughout every technology product you use was made by people who bring their biases and perspectives in. Um, one example, um, I think I've shared this possibly with you before. When I joined Quora, which is question and answer side, I was one of the um, first engineers, I was the second engineer hired onto the team. So we're still quite small as a product, um, pretty small community, maybe a few thousand users, but there was already somebody who was harassing me. And so when I joined the team, the first thing I wanted to do was be able to block him. And because I felt so strongly about this, that was the first thing I did. Like the first thing I built for Quora was a block button, uh, which was great in my case, because I, you know, I got to make my harasser the first person ever blocked on Quora. <laughs> But it also made me think if I hadn't been there, if I didn't have this experience, there's no way that feature would have been prioritized so early. Um, even though you could try to think about like what makes sense for our overall user base or for the target user base that we want to reach. When something impacts you personally, you just feel more strongly about it. Um, I think a lot of the harassment issues in general that we're seeing across so many different social media platforms can be traced back to early decisions by people on these tech teams who didn't think that it would be such a big problem or didn't feel it so viscerally that they wanted to prioritize preemptively addressing them or building in safeguards or building in um, mechanisms um, to address those issues when they arose. So there's the sort of like insight that you have from personal experience, the empathy as well, like feeling it personally. Um, one interesting thing um, I've noticed from working at a number of different companies, particularly like consumer companies, when the employees of a company use a the product, they'll bring tons of opinions into it. So like at Facebook, so I interned at Facebook, everybody at Facebook uses Facebook a ton. And in some ways it's really good because then all of your employees are thinking about how do we wanna make this better um, in their day-to-day, -day, they're looking at all all the aspects of the product and trying to adjust them so that their own experience is better. I've kind of noticed like Google Maps is always way better in the Bay Area than it is elsewhere around the world. I kind of imagine it's probably due to the fact that the engineers, there are people in that area will find all the issues and prioritize fixing them. But in other places in the world, like you have like weird um, you know, issues with the map systems, like they just don't get prioritized because like the engineers are not gonna be experiencing those problems themselves. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Like the people who are part of these companies have a really big impact on the products that are built. I think it's also at the level of what companies are created as startups, like what, what new startup ideas are even arising. Um, one of the things they talk a lot about in sort of startup culture is um, if you can solve your own problems, that's really powerful since you, you are your own customer and we think about the loop of doing user research, trying to figure out like what would be helpful to the person you're building for. If you are that person, you just kind of gut check with yourself, like, do I find this useful? Um, and one of the jokes that people make about some of the startups out of Silicon Valley is that it's a lot of like 20 something year olds building services to replicate what mom used to do for them. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of like other issues with that joke, but um, I think it's kind of accurate. It's like you have food delivery services, you have um, car services, you have laundry services. It kind of makes sense that you wanna solve the, the problems that you experience and that you know really well. But when we look at the demographics of the people creating companies, they tend to be pretty skewed as well. And so even out of the ideas that might have the chance to become products or bigger companies, they tend to be pretty skewed right now. Mm. So let's talk a little bit about Block Party. Um, what exactly is it and how does it work? Mm -hmm. So we're building consumer tools um, for safety and anti-harassment. 
our first product, the way it works is you go to Block Party, you sign up, you link your Twitter account, and then on Block Party, you set your filtering rules. So you can say like, I only want to hear from people who are verified users, followed by people I follow or people I've, I've interacted with recently. Or you could be a bit more open and say like, I'm happy to hear from most people on Twitter, except for people who recently created their accounts, have fewer than some number of followers, um, don't have a profile photo. Do you set these rules for who you want to hear from or not? And then Block Party just runs in the background to filter. Uh, and then you, know, you would use Twitter as normal and all that stuff is just filtered out. So your experience on Twitter is a lot cleaner and calmer. All the stuff that has been filtered ends up in a folder on Block Party. So it's a little bit like a spam folder. We don't pretend that it doesn't exist. Uh, so if you do want to see what's there, you can go and reference it. Um, there's a few reasons for this. One is folks often have FOMO around like, if I filter too much, like what am I gonna miss? Even if the majority of it is bad, if there's some good stuff, like I feel bad having missed the good stuff. And there is a reason why we're using platforms like Twitter, like we, we are be able to, we're able to reach a much bigger audience and we just hear really interesting ideas or engaging with people that are not already within our network. So there's good stuff and that's why we're there. So it feels bad to maybe I cut out all of the potential good stuff, even if it's mixed in with bad. The other reason why we need that folder there is for the really bad cases where there may be threats or other things that you need to be aware of. So in those cases, you can't just pretend that the bad stuff doesn't exist. It's really important to have that situational awareness. Um, one thing that is nice about this design of stuff being filtered out into another folder is you can delegate access to someone to review that folder on your behalf and you can give them permissions to block accounts or um, unmute them or, or do whatever to them. And this is a nicer way of having your community be able to help you than just straight up giving your account credentials to somebody else, which is what we had heard some people doing in the past when they're dealing with really coordinated, really awful harassment. When it would be too awful to look at, they would just hand their phone over to somebody else or hand their username and password over to somebody else to help sort through everything with this. You can set the filtering options on, and then just the stuff that's been filtered, somebody else can help you process it. Um, what's nice about this obviously is then the burden of dealing with the crappy stuff is not fully on the person who's being targeted, which has been a big flaw in the design of a lot of anti-harassment features and systems in the past where you can report accounts, you can block and mute, um, but if you're being hit with like thousands or tens of thousands or more of these things coming in, it's pretty awful to have to be the one responsible to then comb through all of it and take all of the, um, the action. And it's also really terrible emotionally to have to see all this mm -hmm. stuff that's been targeted at you. Um, and while it's not particularly nice for your friend to see it, it doesn't feel anywhere near as bad for someone else to see it as mm -hmm. when it's specifically targeted at you. And so we're helping to like move the emotional burden off of somebody who may already be uh, in a not great state having been dealing with so much of this. Um, so that's kind of like the initial premise of the product. We're adding on other features as well to you know, consider the experience of somebody who may have to deal with a lot of this unpleasant tree uh, and what are the other tools that can be helpful. We recently introduced a new feature um, block list where you can more efficiently block people from a tweet. Uh, so if you want to block everybody who retweeted or liked a tweet, we have ways for you to do that more efficiently. Uh, some of the thinking behind this is that unfortunately for all the good that social media platforms have brought us, they've also brought us a lot of bad stuff at scale. And prior to Block Party, the responses, the, the sort of tools people had to respond to this were not really at the same level of scale. So you could have thousands of people attack you, but you still have to go through one by one to block them or report them. So we're trying mm -hmm. to put a little bit more control back in the hands of people who may be flooded with this stuff. So it can even out that power differential and just gives people a bit more control over their experience. Like you shouldn't have mm -hmm. to see harassment directed at you if you don't want to see it. Like just because somebody wanted to send it to you does not mean that you have to see it. Yeah, I have to say when I, um, cause I'm on your mailing list, uh, <laughs> got sent this, um, this uh, email about you know announcing this new feature and I screen grabbed it and sent it to all my feminist friends saying oh my god look at this thing that we've all been waiting for because when you do get because also actually one of the things we thought would be really helpful for is sometimes one of your friends will get a pylon from some 
very pleasant person. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't want to ever hear from that person and all their mates either. And what I will often do is go and one by one block or mute all the people who have been harassing my friend because I know that I'll be next. Um, and that was just such a such a brilliant um, such a brilliant idea and actually also the and, and I I mean I personally think this is the difference between someone building someone who has experienced building something who has experience of it versus someone who doesn't because that point about sometimes you have to be able to monitor it I think has been really missing in what is available on the other platforms like I have a guy who um who I find a bit disturbing. He sends me emails and sends me messages and I have it all set up to go to my husband um, because I don't want to see it because it freaks me out. But I also don't want to just block him because I worry he could escalate and I don't want him right. escalating in the dark. You know, I want someone yes. to be keeping an eye on it. I just don't want that person to be, to, to be me. Um, yeah, absolutely. I had a kind of a similar experience. With, this may happened with like many people over the years, but one person who had been just responding to everything I was posting, trying to message me. It was, it was a bit creepy and it was very disturbing. And I wouldn't want to see it, so I'd mute this person. But at some point he escalated to actually flying around the world to try to find me in person. And because I had muted um, his messages, I didn't realize this was happening and that mm. completely freaked me out. And then from that point on, um, it was very depressing. Like every night I would have to go and like just check his account to see if there's anything I needed to be concerned about. Cause I wouldn't want to get, I wouldn't want to get push notifications, but I'd still have to go make sure that I was going to be safe. So it was the most mm -hmm. depressing night, to, like pre bedtime activity going through and like checking all of my stalker harasser accounts. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the inspiration. One of the features we built into block party, um, which is the watch list feature. And you can put somebody on the watch list so you don't have to look at their stuff, but if they do tweet something at you, it will generate a notification in Block Party. So when you come and check Block Party, it will show you like there are these new posts from this person that you put on mm. your watch list. So you're still in control of when you see it, um, but you don't you don't need to get pushed this information like on Twitter or whatever platform, um, but there's still some functionality to help you do the monitoring that is necessary. Mm. So, I mean, I guess this has slightly answered the question already then, because the next question I had was, you know, what prompted you to decide to set this up? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of personal experience dealing with this and there's a whole range of unpleasant stuff and people online from the people who don't really know you or care about you, but just like kind of the drive-by trolls to the really dedicated harassers and stalkers. I kind of like experienced the whole range of it. Um, in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years of being on the internet. And it does feel like it's been getting worse. Some of it is probably just like general platform or like across internet type stuff. Some of it is probably from my personal um, like activism work that's increased my profile and like made me more of a target. Um, but some of the other inspiration for wanting to, for wanting to build Block Party was knowing that it could be better from my experience is having worked at a number of these different tech companies as an engineer, having worked on moderation tools, having thought about the policies that we want to put in place. Like I know that it's possible to do better. And as an engineer, I also know how to build some of these tools. Um, I know how we can interact with platforms. I know how decisions get made. So I kind of know like what makes sense, not just on the engineering, not just from the engineering perspective, from the product perspective, um, how to integrate with platforms as well as of course that personal experience of dealing with the problem. Um, one of the things, well, so there's actually a few things in particular um, that triggered me to think about setting up Block Party. One was I was dealing with a number of these incidents um, that got escalated. There were like people who were very, very dedicated, devoted to harassing me. And I went and tried to report all these accounts on Twitter and Instagram and all of the reports got turned back with like, we reviewed your report and there was no evidence of harassment, uh, which was just infuriating because clearly mm. they had set up entire accounts to harass me. Um, mm. But when I screenshotted them and po posted them on my personal Facebook, my friends who work at Twitter and Instagram escalated to their trust and safety teams internally and got the accounts taken down, which was kind of okay, but also frustrating in that it didn't you feel right. You friends that, in the company. Yeah, like I, yeah, I shouldn't need to have this kind of privileged access to get these accounts taken down. Like it actually made me angrier that 
I could have special access that other people couldn't like the system should just work better. I don't think mm. I should be special and privileged. Um, and then the other thing was in dealing with another like really awful stalker, I went to some um, security firms and the police. And one of the pieces of advice I got was it can feel really frustrating um, if you feel helpless when like somebody is attacking you, stalking you, whatever it is, and it doesn't feel like you can do anything in response. And so one thing that's helpful is to flip the perspective and try to think from from their side, like what are they trying to do? So this is helpful for like setting up more security. If you're thinking from their perspective, like what are the ways in which they might try to attack you that you can put up the defenses. Um, but really it's that mindset shift of feeling like you can do something about this. You have agency, um, you can take some control over the situation. You're not just a victim and helpless. Um, and in my case, I felt like the, the best way I could take agency um, and assert control in the situation is try to build a tool that could solve this, not just for me, but for everybody else dealing with this problem. And mm. so it still is awful to deal with harassment. Um, but when I have to deal, you know, go through some of these incidents or like when I'm filing reports to the police or whatever it is, I can still tell myself at least the, the silver lining here is like, this is user research and it's going into <laughs> like the product insight that we need to build our um, product better. Mm. And I feel like- yeah, that's, I, a, <laughs> that's a really interesting way of looking at it. It makes me think of when something really annoying happens to me uh, and it's particularly related to anything to do with my research. I always think of that amazing Nora Ephron quote, which was um, everything is content. And I just try yeah. to remind myself yeah. that, of that all the time. That's basically the tech version of that. Everything yep. is, yep. I don't know what would the word be, like not content. User research, like user yeah. research, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a, well, it's definitely one way to think about it. Um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you because I think you were going to say something else, but don't worry if I've made you forget it because I have more questions. Oh, no, I think that I was wrapping up there. So how okay. can we move on to your next question? Um, I'm just, it seems to me like you get an awful lot of harassment. Um, and, you know, I, I get harassment, but I don't get as much as you do. And I'm wondering if, do you think it's worse for you as a woman in tech? Do you think it's worse for you as a woman of color? Like, is it, I don't know. I just like, why is it so awful yeah. for you? Do you think, have you thought about that? Because I mean, obviously there's the pro public profile asp aspect of it. Um, but it does seem to me like you seem to get a particularly extreme form of, of harassment that, that goes beyond what I think a lot of us in the public eye, a lot of us women in the public mm -hmm. eye tend to get. That's a good question. Um, actually for a long time, I think I would have said that the harassment I get is not that bad compared to some folks that I know. Right. And then I realized that the stuff I was dealing with was actually not okay. Like I had been brushing it off as like, oh, it's not that bad. I just get some randos commenting. It's not really harassment. At some point I realized like, no, like that is harassment. I mean, it doesn't really matter what we define as harassment or not. Like it doesn't really matter what we draw as like the distinguishing line. If it's just stuff that you don't want to see or makes you feel bad, like you shouldn't have to see it mm -hmm. no matter what we label it. Um, but one other thing that I realized in doing a lot of user research and talking to other folks, is that there's many people I talk to who would say, oh, I don't deal with harassment. Like I, it's not really a problem for me. And then like, we'd talk a little bit further and they'd be like, oh, right, but there's like these two creepy people who keep messaging me and like follow me. And like, you know, I had to get some extra security, but like, Oh, I didn't really think of that as harassment. It was just, you know, it was just something I had to live with. Mm. Um, so I do think there, there are some, it's just probably like a coping mechanism for a lot of people who are just like, oh, I, I don't really deal with harassment because we've been trained for so long. There's nothing that can be done. And so like the, the response to it is like, okay, well, like it's not that bad. I'll just live with it. Um, maybe in a similar way to like dealing with street harassment, mm. like, you know, we'll, we'll have people like shout or cat call, to us and there's nothing to do. So you just kind of brush it off and like hope and just pretend that it's not a big deal. So I think that's maybe part of it, like the sort of um, self-identification of these issues of like, is it actually harassment or is it not? Like sometimes we just mm. pretend that it's not that bad because we haven't felt like we can't do anything about it. Um, it is possible that I do get more. Um, I don't know why that might be. I do think some of it is probably tied to race. Like I got a, a big uptick in racist harassment during the pandemic. Um, probably right. true for a lot of folks who are Asian. Um, 
in particular very Chinese or Chinese uh, looking descent. Mm. Um, I guess there's probably some part of that. Um, I think also sometimes it's just like bad luck if you get on the radar of people who are particularly motivated to harass mm. and coordinate their friends. Um, yeah. So I dealt with a couple of bad incidents where like I went on Reddit, which was just dumb. Like Reddit is a nest of trolls. And I feel like I just kicked the trolls nest and they all came out to attack me. Um, so that, I mean, that was partially my fault. I shouldn't have gone on Reddit, but also like it, if I, well, I, I shouldn't have to be worrying about that. Um, no, like that's then, <laughs> very clear. I wanted to let you finish your sentence, but yeah. now that you um, paused, yeah. <laughs> that was not your fault. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then I also got unlucky from there because the Reddit thread got onto 4chan. There were a couple of threads on 4chan about this. And so mm. then the 4chan trolls came to attack. So I think it was a couple of like unlucky incidents. And then mm. once people saw me as a target, then they like really came out and attacked. Um, in the mm. course of like day-to-day -day posting on Twitter, I don't get that much or now I've already blocked and muted so many people like I feel like my my experience is actually quite pleasant um <laughs> except when I go look at like all the stuff I've muted and blocked and it looks bad but um mm. yeah I don't know it feels not that bad but it's also hard to say like what not that bad really means mm. um you mentioned just now that you've got more racist um abuse uh during the pandemic and uh that was something I, I had kind of wondered about more generally um, well, for a start, I was interested in your take on whether this is getting worse or better. And I was also interested in whether you think the pandemic has made things worse in general, as well as specifically um, against, um, you know, people who are perceived to be of Chinese origin. Um, like everyone staying at home with nothing better to do. Yes. Yeah. Has that made the problem worse? Yeah, so it does appear that the problem is worse, although it's hard to say based on data because for external researchers, like you're not gonna have access to the full data set. Like you can kind of like sample what you can see, but there's gonna be bias in your sampling. So it's a bit hard to say. Um, there have been some folks who have done some data analysis and they seem to suggest that like the numbers have um, gone up around harassment, but it, it's a bit difficult even for the platforms themselves they can run their analysis over like all the content being produced, but depending on their identification algorithm, it's not totally clear. It does mm. seem like the problem is worse. I think like what you said is right. Like this kind of my hypothesis as well. People are just at home a lot more and they're online a lot more. Um, there's probably some bit, bit of it that's tied to the frustration, depression, anger, like mm. all the bad feelings around pandemic, losing work, high stress, like all the bad stuff. And if people are using the internet as an outlet, then there's probably mm. gonna be more of that stuff being channeled toward other folks online. Um, I think all the, the things that were true before the pandemic are still true of when you don't have a human connection to somebody, it feels a lot easier to say really mm. nasty things to them. Like they don't feel as human. Um, and so if you're primarily engaging with folks online, you don't really know them as people, and you're frustrated, upset, have other negative emotions, probably is easier to spout bad stuff towards them. Mm. Do you think it had been getting worse anyway, like before the pandemic even happened? I think so. I think it was getting worse and maybe the pandemic accelerated it. Um, probably from folks just being more online, um, more of the sort of like algorithmic amplification radicalization of folks it mm. seems like those are trends that were already happening um you know if you i think there's been like some more recent research of folks like um setting up like new accounts and then just being pushed all this misogynistic content and then once you start clicking on it it gets worse and worse and you just get recommended more and more of it so there's probably some effect that was already in play before mm. um the pandemic of like what the algorithms are doing um as an American, I think maybe I can also like speak to <laughs> my country, uh, my country's leadership over the last like four or five years, which was not great. Um, I think having really high profile figures who are very okay to say awful things and kind of set the norm around like being awful, um, it's probably not 
not going to mm. lead to good outcomes. I mean, on that topic of setting the norm, do you think do you think the the sort of cat has been let out of the bag now and it's just impossible to ever put it back in um, in terms of, you know, you were saying about how at the beginning, because of who set up these platforms, i.e. people who weren't experiencing harassment and therefore they didn't put in place um, these uh, these preventative tools. So now this norm has been set for this is how we speak to each other on the internet. This is how we treat each other on the internet. Is that once that norm has been set, is it possible to to change it? I think it is possible. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about what are the analogies between online world and offline world and things like social norms, I feel like can be learned pretty quickly. Like if you go to a new environment, you'll pick up the norms there pretty quickly. Um, I think the problem that we're facing with all these online systems is there's no will or commitment to change what's happening. And some of that is um, the incentive models of these companies, which kind of responding to like capitalist incentives or that you're supposed to make more money and you do that by having more engagement so you can sell more ads because you have more active users. Um, mm. And if there's no motivation to change how that system works, then the norms that arise from people's interactions on these platforms are also not gonna change. But do you think, you, I mean, surely you could make a capitalist argument, you know, an economic argument for people's uh, engagement increasing if it was not such a horrible place to be. Like I really limit my time on social media because it makes me feel so awful because people are so horrible, you know? Yeah. And it's not even just the abuse, it's just the general nasty tone of it. Um, it's, it's a really sort of, um, I I'm, try I'm trying to think of the, of the, of the word, but it's, it's just, it's not, it's not a heartwarming place to be. Let's put it that way. You yeah. know, even when people aren't attacking other people, they're being, you know, sarcastic and this really mean, mean spirited. That's the term mm -hmm. I'm looking for. Social media is mean spirited, even when it's not abusive. And I feel like I would probably spend more time if I didn't know that if I didn't go onto my social media with a sense of dread of what am I going to see now that's going to make me feel awful. Yeah, I think some of the um, issues there and sort of like the responses of these companies is that your withdrawal from the platforms or like you're participating less is not as visible in the metrics, especially right. in the short term versus right. people who are like actively posting uh, and really engaged because they posted something really outraged and mean spirited and getting, they're getting tons of retweets and likes for it. Like that shows up in the short term metrics and you mm. spending less time and drifting away is not as obvious to them. And it's it's probably a long-term thing. Um, maybe another example from like personal experience, like most of my friends don't use Facebook very actively anymore. People used to be on Facebook a lot more, but kind of have drifted away uh, mm. or they limit their time there. But that doesn't show up in the metrics immediately. It's just like, oh, people are logging in less. You don't really know what's causing the log log in less, but there are some folks who are still very actively engaged. And so like all of the algorithms end up like amplifying what their behavior is and try to encourage them to like be mm. sticky. Um, so I think that so is what you're that saying is by me being on it less, I'm making the problem worse because the people who remain <laughs> are driving the algorithms. <laughs> Possibly. I mean, that is something I worry about sometimes just like when all the like people who care or are good and like want to do something better get driven away, then like the people who are left are, I don't know, maybe not the ones we want to be setting the norms and like defining how mm. all this works. Yeah. Oh, well, that's depressing. Um, <laughs> so uh, just to talk a bit more about, about Block Party, I'm really interested to know, other than that horrendous Reddit experience, um, what's the general reaction been? And I'm thinking um, partly about your users, but also about your, your peers in the tech industry, you know, the people who have come up at the same time as you and are off doing their own stuff what's been the reaction in the industry generally yeah um so there's an interesting like intersection of folks who work in tech and also use block party and i think they're a really mm. interesting test case so they're probably like the ones who are more likely to test out our product early on because they were more likely to have heard of it because I, i'm in tech and probably more likely to be connected to them and um 
that you started using the product and have had a really positive experience. And I'll just be very candid as like an engineer and founder. My experience with like building product is like you want to launch stuff before you feel fully ready because otherwise you're going to take too long polishing mm-hmm. things. So when you first put a product out there, you're almost always embarrassed by it and you know all the flaws. You feel like there's so much more we wanted to build that we haven't built yet. And so I've actually been really pleasantly surprised by how much people seem to love using Block Party and how much it improves their experience. Because in my head, I've been thinking like, there's still so much more we want to do. Like, this is not really my vision yet. Um, mm. But it, it has been really nice to see um, folks using the product and just getting a lot of benefit out of it, like more mental headspace, just be able to use Twitter and not deal with all the negative stuff. Um, so it's like that kind of intersection of users with like tech industry folks, it's been really positive. Um, from other folks in the industry, there are some, there's actually a pretty good contingent of folks who don't necessarily experience um, the problem of abuse and harassment personally, but are appalled by what has been enabled by tech. And so they are happy to see that somebody is addressing this problem. And so they're very supportive. It's been really great to see that. Um, in terms of like on the investment side, the sort of venture capital community, mm-hmm. um, it has been a lot more frustrating where I just encountered all the sort of bias you might expect knowing how Silicon Valley has operated. Um, a lot of like white male VCs who would tell me this is not a problem. Um, I went Wait, into so one. harassment is not a problem? <laughs> yes. Or right, they okay. think it's very niche. And like, I was mm-hmm. also told that the platforms are already solving it. In fact, it's basically a solved problem already. Like I was mm-hmm. told this last year. Like I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain this is not a solved problem, and it is <laughs> unfortunately like pretty widespread. Um, but just that sort of um, condescension and dismissal of the problem was very frustrating, mm. and it was in large part because the these people I was talking to don't personally experience it and aren't curious to understand the experience of others who are different from them, um, and. Like one interesting thing I've seen play out is there aren't actually that many companies in this space. There's a handful of other anti-harassment companies. Um, But I've seen the ones that are led by men, like Mm. white and Asian men raise just like loads of money more than me. Um, So like 10 times as much in funding going to founders who have never worked in social media companies, have never experienced a problem themselves, are non-technical and not the ones that are going to build this. They've easily raised like 10 times as much money as me. Um, And in some ways it's it's a good thing to not raise too much money because it forces more discipline, like raising too much money at too high valuation very early is actually not good for a lot of startups. Um, But it's just really fascinating to see that difference and like who can raise money and who the venture capitalists are willing to put big bets on. Um, Mm. And sort of like pushback that I was getting um about like oh the market's too small and like I mean that's we could talk for a long time about that but like a lot of the the sort of questions investors would pose to me they seem to not have these questions of male founders if they were working on the same problem Mm. um and it's been really frustrating to deal with that as well as like in one of these really frustrating cases one of these investors um who had backed a competitor uh to block party which like actually just straight up pivoted to copy us because they were flailing around because I don't think they had any insight into actually how to solve this problem. Like one of the investors like went on Twitter and was trying to gaslight me and say like, oh, like you came around much later than this other company. That's why I backed them. I was like, I have the email receipts of like, when we first talked about this stuff, like we're on the same email thread, like me and the other founder and this investor. But it's just like the sort of posturing that mm. investors will do to say like, oh, I care about solving this problem. So I'm gonna back the white man who's solving this with no experience. <laughs> it's just been, it's just incredibly frustrating. Um, mm. So it's been really fascinating to work on this problem where I guess I have an advantage of working on in that like I experience a problem and I, I know it firsthand, partly from being a woman and a minority. Um, but then that adversely impacts my ability to operate in the sort of like Silicon Valley Mm. systems because for whatever reason, like people would look at me as a female founder and then think I'm not as backable or the problem is just not gonna be as big or I can't build a successful business out of it. I mean, I'm feeling really angry 
<laughs> listening to you talking you don't sound very angry um are you are you not angry <laughs> i am angry i've also been told by many people on twitter that i am too angry and i should be less angry so now i've gotten used to saying the things that make me angry without looking too angry right <laughs> <laughs> i mean i yeah that's probably not a bad uh bad approach but it's it's um I, I just feel so furious listening to this as as a woman who wants other women to succeed, but also as a woman who experiences harassment and therefore wants these tools to be built in such a way that will actually solve the problem. Um, yeah, it's infuriating and we don't yeah, really have was... time to fix the uh, investor issue. But what yeah. were you going to say? Yeah, that's one of the things about like um, this other company that was much more well-funded than us copying us. So they had started off uh, taking a different approach. And Is then, that legal? It's, it's legal. Like I think in tech, it's kind of like you can copy ideas. It's more about the execution. So like I think it's totally fair game for them to copy us. What was really frustrating to me about that experience was they're so much better funded just because of the demographics of the founder, I guess. Um, mm. But what would make me really angry is like if uh, a more well-funded competitor pivoted to copy us and then if they were able to like um, put us out of the market, put us out of competition because they're so much better funded, then they would be the ones attempting to solve the problem but without actually any insight into it because if they don't actually know what they're doing. So all they can do is copy. So if they copy us and then put us out of business, they have no one left to copy who they can mm. actually get the insight from to solve the problem. So that was the thing that really pissed me off the most where I was like, you know, if they were copying us and they were, they actually understood the problem better and we're going to really solve this better than I could, I'm actually fine with that. Like, I want this problem solved. Like, that is my biggest motivation. I don't really care about making a bunch of money or the sort of like you know, ego stuff that a lot of founders are into. Like, I just really want to solve this problem because I deal with it. I don't like it. I don't like that so many other people are faced with it, especially women and minorities. And often the people that we most want to hear from, like the people representing marginalized communities and like are sharing their experiences and insights and like trying to push for a better world, like the activists, journalists, doctors, science, like the people that we most want to hear from are being silenced by abuse. Like this pisses me off so much and I really want to solve the problem. And so like this whole competition, like competitors thing, like it doesn't bother me. Like, if, if it means that like there are more people trying to solve the problem in a way that like needs to get solved faster. Like, that's fine. But if they're just copying us because they don't know what they're doing and they can put us out of business because they're better funded, mm. that, that makes me very angry. <laughs> yeah. Well, as it should, um, how are we going to fix it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to keep working on this and um, hopefully show all these folks, especially the investors who are doubtful that people even want this, that people mm. do want it. Um, obviously it is up to me and up to us as a company to show that there is a market for this product and people want to pay for it. We can build a business out of it. Um, I have a lot of other complicated thoughts about this where like, it feels unfair that the people dealing with abuse have to be the ones to pay for solutions to mm. it, but there's like big problems in society. And I think it's still more important that people have these tools. Um, and mm we're trying to think about ways that we can support folks who maybe can't afford um, to pay. But in general, like I, I, you know, like I need to show that this is a business, um, it's viable and like build out the, um, the usefulness of the product. So more and more folks um, find it helpful. And you know, that, that's kind of like up to me, um, but obviously, um, yeah, it, it's it's a hard problem for like any startup to build something new, bring it to market and, and justify their existence as a business. Mm. So are you able to talk at all about your future plans for Block Party or is that privileged information? <laughs> uh, I guess there's different versions of it. Like in terms of long-term vision, I'm very happy to talk about um, what our goals are. I think the, the ultimate vision, like the ideal world as we see it is people, everybody should be able to go online and feel safe, interacting, like engaging online um, and feel in control of that experience. How we get there is obviously going to be a tricky journey. Um, what we're doing right now at Blog Party is building on top of the existing platforms and kind of acknowledging that like 
this is where people are right now. And so mm. even though it can be difficult to build on existing platforms, you're limited by the APIs, what they allow you to do. Um, this is where people are right now. And so it's really important that people can use the existing platforms that are big, that are already like so important in society. Um, as we think a little bit longer term, it's also how do we go cross platform? So it's not just within like one platform, you might be addressing the issues, but seeing like how bad behavior kind of spills over to multiple platforms. Can we do interesting things as a third party to join together information from all these different platforms? Um, and then there's also a layer, which is like as new startups, new communities, new social platforms are arising, like can we work with them to proactively address these safety issues before they become so prevalent and, and so um, difficult? We've already had a number of um, companies reach out to us for building new platforms saying like, we know that if we're allowing people to interact on this platform we're building, that we have the potential of abuse and like bad stuff happening. Like, mm. is there anything that you can provide us that we can integrate into our service now? And right mm. now, Block Party is still too small, but I'm already thinking that direction of like, if people are creating new platforms, like what are the things that they would need to be able to build mm. safety and from the get-go, how do we make it as easy as possible for people to be designing with safety in mm. mind from the beginning? That's amazing. Um, That's really exciting. Yeah. I feel really excited yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think some of it is also just like creating standards where you think about like for new, for people creating new platforms, like what is the, the default list of things like they need to be thinking about? Um, and this is starting to get very technical, so I don't know if this analogy will work, but um, Stripe is a really big company in the payment space because what they've made it easy for companies to do is like uh, for any engineers or developers, they can integrate with Stripe as the API mm -hmm. to do all their payments processing. With you know, whatever co other companies these are, like they don't have to worry about payment stuff because they're not payments companies. They just want to be able to take payments. And so mm -hmm. Stripe has kind of offloaded the responsibility of like dealing with payment stuff um, from those companies. And one of the nice things about the way Stripe works is like they'll define all these constructs that um, you need to implement to match up with their system. So like they'll say like, here are the sort of objects in our system. There's customers, there's prices, there's subscriptions. And they define mm. like, here's all these like objects you should know about. And like, when you integrate with us, you need to have these equivalent concepts defined on your side. What we could do um, with safety and moderation is essentially establish the same sorts of like standards where it's like, you need to implement something like a block function. You need to implement something like a mute function. You need to implement something like a report function to integrate with us. And then mm -hmm. it sets out the standard of like, if you want to have safety, like here's the kind of the checklist of things you need to do, like here are the standards you need to implement. Um, so I think there's a, a lot that can be done on that front of just like helping people to know, like what are the default things you need to be thinking about when you're building out mm -hmm. any kind of platform where people can talk to people. Yeah, um, I've been extremely greedy and left very little time for questions from the audience. Um, I'm very sorry about that. I'm terrible at timekeeping. I don't know if anyone does have a question. If, if, if people don't have questions, okay, there is someone who has a question. So uh, Patricia, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. Okay, first of all, thank you very much, Tracy, for what you are doing and for your courage. You know, oh, because wow. it takes a lot to do what you are doing I work in tech. I'm, and what I'm curious, you know, for, for you know, time, uh, issues is you, you, as you said, you know, at the end, people can copy, Facebook can copy you, Twitter can copy you. And I'm curious about your hypothesis, why, you know, they are paying $1 an hour for surveillance to people in Africa, Latin America and Asia. To for surveillance, and why wouldn't and you know they have copied, for example, Snapchat? Why they don't copy you, and they let they prefer to leave that actually to leave the people disempowered on their platforms? It's hmm. a really interesting question. So there are a few things um, about what we're working on, which. I think actually make a lot of sense to be separated from the platforms when we're talking about giving users more choice, um, letting them have more control over their experience. Um, the platforms in some cases, I, I know Twitter the, the most, uh, the best because we're working so closely with them, but they actually prefer to offload some of this to third parties. If they were to build some of this internally, 
it might be viewed as censorship or like it's it doesn't feel good um, to have it built as a standard within their platform. Um, and so they'd actually rather offload some of these things. Like I've, I've tried with folks there who've said things like, you know, we don't wanna be the ones responsible for deciding who's a verified user or not. We would so much rather someone else be the ones to do that. Cause like, we don't want to be an editorial <laughs> responsible for this stuff or like misinformation. Like they've started a, a, sometimes applying labels on misinformation. Like we don't wanna be the ones who are doing this. We'd rather a third party be the one to do this stuff. Um, and I think there, there is a bit of this mentality within some of the platform companies, like we're just a platform, like we don't want to be responsible for these other sort of like editorial decisions. Um, so I think there's room for third parties like Block Party to be the ones who would take on that mantle and say, we're gonna build out for all these cases that the platforms themselves don't wanna do. Um, the other thing is, even though I think there are a lot of folks who benefit from like the features that Block Party is building, for the platforms, when they're prioritizing their list of things that they want to build, like usually they're not gonna be, they're not gonna prioritize the sorts of stuff that we wanna build. Um, one conversation I had with one of these platform companies was around like uh, evidence collection documentation. And this is something that is pretty important in like some harassment case where you need to be able, you need to be able to file a report. Um, in some cases you may, may need to even like take it to court, um, especially in sort of like domestic abuse cases um, or like these kind of like ex-partner um, violence cases and talk to somebody at a platform. She was like, oh yeah, we've, we've discussed this idea before. Um, kind of in a way that was like poo-pooing the fact that like block party or somebody else might want to work on it. And my response to her was like, well, like, okay, so you've discussed it, but like you clearly haven't implemented it. Right. And she was like, yeah, it's not a priority for us. Like we actually do hear from folks all the time, like domestic abuse victims that they really want this, but like, it's not a priority for us. I was like, that's the mm -hmm. point. Like you're never gonna prioritize this. You, you have thousands of engineers, but, or however many it is, but amongst your list of priorities, this is not very high up. And that doesn't mean that there aren't folks who really, really want this and would benefit from having this tool exist. Um, and there is space for companies like Block Party to build out for these these different use cases or people or customers um, where the platforms themselves like don't prioritize those things. So for example, like an evidence collection tool, like it's really hard to imagine any of the platform companies prioritizing building a very good evidence collection tool because it's not what they do. Like they're, you know, a social media platform. Like they're not going to invest a lot of resources internally into doing something like this. Um so we only have one minute left. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I went on for a little while. No, 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 but do you have time for one more question? Because yeah. uh, there's a question yeah. from Sarah, which I think is quite interesting because it's related to the difficulty of getting investors to buy into this. And she asks, um, did you consider crowdfunding at any point? Or would you consider crowd crowdfunding? I mean, would it just not be possible to get the kind of investment that you need that way? I think it is possible and um, it's something that I have on my list to research a little bit to see how viable it is. Um, one thing about fundraising, at least in this sort of traditional startup VC model is fundraising takes a lot of energy. Um, mm. And so that's it's just a big distraction from anything else you're doing. It is necessary in the case where you haven't yet reached profitability, you need to fundraise. Um, but it has the time and energy spent fundraising has to be traded off against everything else you're doing. And there's also some considerations around fundraising. If you can get somebody to write a really big check, like a $3 million check or something bigger in one go, that's so mm. much more efficient than going around getting lots of small checks. Um, my experience in fundraising was like, I was pitching some folks and some of them, I'd imagine that they were gonna be writing bigger checks and in the end they would say like, oh, like I only write five, five thousand dollar checks maybe if I decide I want to invest and I was like five thousand dollars is not nothing but if I have to go take a meeting for every like five thousand dollar check for the chance of getting five thousand dollars it's just not practical mm -hmm. um, obviously this is different with crowdfunding if you're just going to put up all the information people can decide whether or not to put in money um, but there are other considerations around like how, how, how do you want to run this campaign there are ways to do it properly how does mm -hmm. that fit alongside potentially like raising institutional money um, often with like raising institutional money, 
you'll have a lead investor that's going to be the one to set the terms around like what the valuation is, which then determines like how much dilution you're taking in the company, how much of it you're selling. So there's just a lot of like things to consider around how do we juggle institutional plus like angel investors plus potentially crowdfunding and like would mm-hmm. the amount of money you could potentially raise there be worth the effort versus trying to go more institutional. Right. Well, um, I had so many more questions to ask and I just, uh, just, I just chatted too much, but thank you so much, Tracy. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and thank you everyone uh, who joined us. Um, yeah. Thank you uh, yeah, Patricia thank for you. the, for the applause. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, it was just, it was just so fantastic. I'm so grateful you could join us and um, I hope everyone had a fantastic time and everyone enjoy your evening. And I will see you uh, at the next GFP Live. (laughs) Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.